Здравствуйте, товарищи. Hey, I'm afraid it's me again. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, please sit down. Um, <coughs> I'd first of all like to introduce our very distinguished uh, panel. Um, to my immediate right, um, Ms. Rose Guttermuller, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, um, President uh, Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic of Croatia, um, Ivana Klimpush Tsinzadze, the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine for European and Euro Atlantic Integration. And as those of you who were at the gala dinner last night will know, uh, Senator Jean uh, Shaheen, who delivered such an eloquent address last night, the Democrat uh, Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you very much for being with us today. I think we should just go straight in with this. Um, yesterday, um, Ms. Uh, Gurmuli, you said that the Secretary General of NATO had spoken to uh, President-elect mm -hmm. Trump. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether you could elaborate a little on how that conversation went and whether uh, the Secretary General has a message to convey to an audience here and also around the world. This is going out all over the world. And as you know, there's a tremendous amount of, um, well, nervousness is, nervousness is not too strong a word about the relationship between the president-elect and NATO. Very good, Robin. Thank you. And first of all, I'd like to thank and congratulate the Halifax International Security Forum for this all-girl band. <laughs> it's really <laughs> terrific. And also, I wanted to say thank you for the quality and skill with which these videos have been put together. Sputnik News is undoubtedly always very entertaining, but to see it all put together in that way is quite <laughs> remarkable. So thank you, Halifax, for that as well. I've uh, gone back to Sekgen to uh, hear more about his, uh, his discussions yesterday with, uh, with the president-elect, Donald Trump. And there were two clear messages that came out of it. The two men agreed, and I want to stress, the two men agreed about the enduring, enduring importance of the NATO alliance and the enduring importance of increased defense spending. So those are the two core messages that came out of their conversation yesterday. And I wanted for you to juxtapose it with the visit of President Obama to Europe this week when he spoke again and again about his conversations with President-elect Trump as well, and the theme there, again, about the enduring importance of the NATO alliance. So to start us off this afternoon, I wanted to hit those two messages really hard. Defense spending and the alliance, they're both of enduring importance. And the Secretary General, as far as you could understand, you, you've spoken to him yesterday and today about this conversation. I mean. It, it, Insofar as he, I mean, he doesn't have a crystal ball, but was he surprised by the reception he had from Mr. Trump, given some of the rhetoric that was used during the campaign? Pleasantly surprised? Well, I think, quite honestly, we have seen um, a kind of evolution in the president-elect's uh, comments on NATO, even during the campaign. For example, he took NATO to task for not paying enough attention to the necessity of uh, a strong... Uh, intelligence uh, organization within the alliance not being able to support the counterterrorism fight in a timely way. And then when we a uh, short time ago appointed an assistant secretary general for intelligence, by the way, something that had been in the works for quite some time, but nevertheless, um, the uh, then campaigner, Mr. Trump, said that he thought, you know, this was a good step, that NATO was taking the counterterrorism fight seriously. And I think that's, that, too, is an important message. But it was one that uh, I think we'd all heard about in NATO beforehand. So we knew that the president-elect's views on NATO itself were evolving. Madam President, I mean, when you hear this, is this something that reassures you? Certainly, yes. Uh, and to begin with, I'd like to say that in today's world, we need more NATO rather than less NATO. Uh, I was running for president myself, and I can sort of look at uh, Mr. Trump's position. Uh, when you're running for an election, especially if you had not been in the government before, uh, your campaign is very much shaped for, by your personal views. But ultimately, I believe that Mr. Trump wants to do good, that he wants to leave a positive legacy. So when he uh, is inaugurated into office, I believe that his views 
um, he will continue to have his beliefs. But he view, his views will be shaped by uh, what he will be briefed about, by international commitments that the United States has made to NATO, to the North Atlantic Alliance, and by um, the simple fact that, there, that the situation in the world requires cooperation between Europe and the United States. Um, it requires transatlantic unity, solidarity, and continued cooperation, especially in uh, terms of intelligence sharing and many other aspects where we need to bring our Euro-Atlantic space out of the box that we've been living in. I come from Croatia, which experienced war and aggression back in the 90s, but most of Europe lived in peace and security for decades that's been taken for granted. The outside world has been changing, so the Euro-Atlantic community needs to look at those changes, embrace, uh, uh, embrace those changes, and look at ways how NATO can adjust to the current situation, looking not just at the traditional uh, or conventional threats, which remain, but also at other aspects such as hybrid warfare, cyber defense, uh, etc. So um, I think that uh, in the future, that uh, in the time ahead of us, we will find a common language. But I do agree with the fact that we all need to keep our obligations, be beginning with my own country, Croatia. I was at the last summit in Warsaw, and unfortunately, <coughs> Croatia was one of the few countries that has not increased the defense spending budget. And for me, defense spending, it's not spending, it's an, it's an investment, and it's about keeping our international commitments, uh, the principle of solidarity, the fact that as a country, we have made commitments to do so. But first and foremost, it's about ensuring for our own defense and security, investing into not just our armed forces, but the whole security apparatus in order to be able to deal with the new threats that are coming closer to Europe, with the crisis that are affecting Europe, the European Union, and the transatlantic community from hybrid warfare, from the arc of instability in the MENA region in the east, and the migration waves, which unfortunately have been penetrated and used as sort of a hybrid warfare against Europe and the European Union. Uh, this is part of a question which I want to expand upon a little later, but you, you mentioned uh, and you volunteered that, that Croatia itself must, must raise its game in Absolutely. terms of defence spending to the 2%. Do you think that the, the comments of, uh, of President-elect Trump during the campaign have actually sort of you know, dropped a firework uh, in people's pants and people are starting to think, hold on, it was all right with the previous administration and the one before that making all these rhetorical commitments. Now we're actually going to have to do it, otherwise there's going to be trouble. No, I don't think we should be pushed by arguments like that. It's our own responsibility. It's about your own country's image, your own credibility, your solidarity. And, you know, if you want others to keep your promises to yourself, you have to keep your promises to others. So, and, and the, the world is becoming increasingly interconnected. So we can all, even countries like Croatia, which is not big in size or numbers of population or the GDP, we can still make our own contributions and we have been making those contributions in accordance with our capabilities and resources considering, as I said, that we recently experienced war and aggression. But I think that also these, um, not just the rhetorical messages, but the messages that you do with deeds and not just words are very important, that you belong to a certain family, that you consider a family, and that you're determined to stand shoulder by shoulder with everyone who's in the alliance. Now, of course, the decrease of the defense budget was unfortunately the result that Croatia experienced a very long recession of more than half and six and a half years. But I'm happy to see the commitment of the new government who's taking this very seriously, the international obligations, but also the homeland security system and the new concept. And I'm encouraged that they will continue to move, not just in increasing the defense spending, but increasing in, in the areas where we really need it, and that is technological, development, innovation, and harmonization of our equipment with the Western, with the NATO standards. Um, Deputy Prime Minister, there is a, a theory out there that the people, the countries that are already in NATO ultimately don't have an awful lot to worry about from President-elect Trump. The worry might be those countries which are partner countries, countries in the so-called gray zone, which have a relationship with NATO but for whom it would require an enormous political push, probably from the United States, to get them in. 
Are you worried in Ukraine that this is pretty much the end of the road for the accession process to NATO? Well, thank you very much for the question and uh, thank you for this opportunity to address this distinguished group of uh, professionals of high, highest league. Um, well, first and foremost, I think um, it's very important um, to remember that uh, um, NATO is an organization where the decisions are being taken by everybody, by consensus, and I think that that's uh, something that should be ensuring and should be uh, guaranteeing the discussion when Ukraine places, for example, its uh, uh, application for membership. I do want to return back to, to earlier days of uh, like 2008 when I think that was a um, not a very useful compromise uh, that NATO has made with coming up with uh, uh, the decision of not granting MAP to Ukraine and Georgia at that point. Uh, this was the, but, the uh, Bucharest but promising, Yes, but promise, uh, Bucharest Summit. Uh, but promising that one day these countries will become uh, NATO members um, as such because um, it's the, the open door policy is there and we hope that it is really there and it's up to NATO to decide at, at some point. But we also have to understand that such nations as, as Ukraine, um, our nation has made a very clear choice done by people. We will not be trading, you know, our... Um, Mm, territorial integrity for any sort of neutrality. Uh, we are um, standing between basically two blocks. We are standing between NATO and Tashkent block. And that has to be understood. We cannot remain uh, neutral. We cannot be, um, pretend that, that we can be uh, Switzerland, for example. Uh, because we will see, unfortunately, that uh, um, if this shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder, um, stance, this unity will not happen that President uh, Grabar Ketarovic was uh, um, referring to, then it means that we will be allowing the aggressor to go further and to be more, even more aggressive. So it's, a, and we are hoping that this, um, this will not happen because the other countries who have already understood very well where do, do they stand and what they are up against, uh, they will take the, the message also to to the U.S. Um, new um, presidency. And I also, I was talking to, to senators that we Ukrainians have enjoyed uh, bipartisan support of the Congress over this two and a half years. And I think that that's something that we are expecting, that the policy with regard to these national security threats and uh, uh, international commitments will be built upon as well, that it will have a reflection in the stance uh, of the administration. Thus, we hope that there is less um, need to be worried for us. Nonetheless, there is obviously a question around the relationship that President-elect Trump wants to have with Russia. And it isn't very difficult to imagine a deal being struck by the United States with Russia. We'll give you Crimea. We'll forget about it. You get out of eastern Ukraine, OK? We'll sort something out in Syria. And we'll leave Ukraine as a neutral country. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is not that I don't have sympathy with your position. And I'm sure that 99% of the people in this room have sympathy with the position of Ukraine. But if that happens, what are your options? What are your options if that happens? Well, How are you going to ensure uh, that any other nations would trust you? You know, I really believe that the whole issue of non-proliferation after Ukraine has been basically betrayed upon Budapest memorandum of 1994 is really at stake for the whole world. And I think that everybody else has to really worry about that. Mm. Because what are you going to promise those nations that would like to acquire nu nuclear weapons um, because Ukraine didn't really feel the assurances and guarantees that have been promised in that um, document that was called Budapest Memorandum of 1994. So um, I think that it's not only about us or it's the war right now, which is going on, and uh, illegal annexation and occupation of the eastern part, this is not war against Ukraine. It is war against Canada. It is war against the US. It is war against uh, Croatia, unfortunately. But we have to realize that, and we have to be actually cap 
able to respond to ourselves uh, very um, sincerely. What are we standing up against? Uh, what exactly, for, for NATO states, what would be the Article 5 trigger? Little green man coming into, let's say, I don't know, I don't want to, to call them uh, to, to some country, so in one of the NATO countries. So without any insignia, does it, is it a trigger for everybody else to, to actually engage in protecting that country or attack on the um, um, internet that we've seen already uh, in the US? Is it already an attack that calls for employing of, of Article 5? I think there is a lot, there are a lot of issues that right now NATO as an institution has to, to answer itself to, nations have to uh, uh, answer themselves. And I think we are just part of the solution, even though we seem to be at this, part, uh, at this time part of the problem. We are contributors already to, um, to what should become a, a, a new um, um, platform for, for security and, and stability in the world. I really believe so. Senator Shaheen, I mean, one of the points, um, among several very interesting points raised by the Deputy Prime Minister, um, seemed to me that what this is about is getting the new administration, and every administration when it's new has to start rethinking the world and what it wants to do, to, to understand that the moving parts actually move together. It's like a clock where one thing moves and then something else moves. You can't take something in isolation. So the kind of theoretical deal uh, that I, I put out for the purposes of discussion I mean, do you believe, even though you come from, uh, from obviously from the other party, not from the Republican Party, do you believe that President-elect Trump is going to be persuadable that you've got to have a global vision um, in which NATO is a central part, not something where you simply rhetorically say, yes, we support NATO, and I love NATO today, and who knows what tomorrow. Do, do, you, do you have some confidence, leaving aside the, the party political part of the equation, uh, that, that, that that is a possibility and that may transpire? Well, first of all, let me support the deputy minister when she says there is strong bipartisan support in the Congress for Ukraine. Um, there is no doubt about that. And one of the things that, um, as we speculate about what a President Trump might do, I think it's important to remind people, as you've heard from some of the, my colleagues on previous panels, is that we have three branches of government in the United States. We have the executive, the president, and we have the Congress, the legislative branch. And the Congress, even if we're of the same party, don't always agree with the executive branch. And I think um, we will see Congress continue to take many of the same positions that we have in the past. I think there's a great deal of concern about Russia and Russia's aggressive policies. Um, at the same time, there is strong support for NATO. And I don't see that changing under President Trump. And I think that will hopefully have some impact on what the administration policies are. Um, so I, I do think we will continue to see support for NATO. We will con continue to see concern also about the level of defense spending, because that's something that is not just an issue for uh, the president-elect, it's been an issue for Congress. And, and it's a reflection, um, not just as the president said so well, of, of um, the commitments that countries have made, but it's also a reflection of the increasingly dangerous world that we're living in and the increasing threats that we're facing. So um, as you pointed out, you know, 10 years ago when it looked like there were not any external threats to Europe, um, it was less important that everybody keep to their commitments of the 2% of GDP for defense spending for NATO. Now, as we face cyber threats, as we face uh, increased Russian aggression, as we face the threat of terrorism from um, the Islamic State, it's clear that we need to look at the level of spending and make sure that it is there to address the threats that NATO is facing. 
that is a perfect segue into the question I, I wanted to, a, a broader question, I, and I partly referred to it earlier. There's a sense that, that, that I have here that uh, Vladimir Putin had better be very careful what he wished for, because if Donald Trump achieves the aim of getting every NATO member to raise its game to 2% of GDP, we are talking tens and tens of billions of extra dollars worth of military capacity for NATO. I mean, a lot of the questions I started out with looked on the negative side and the, and the nervousness side. But is there a scenario here where if President Trump does get his way, NATO emerges as a vastly stronger organization than it is today? Well, look, Robin, it's already headed down that road, I would say. Um, it's very clear to me after only five weeks on the job, entering into my sixth week this weekend, that NATO left the Warsaw Summit with a strong sense of purpose. Part of it is about an increasingly aggressive Russia. There's no question about it. And the tasks laid out by uh, the NATO alliance to pursue deterrence and defense as uh, strong necessities for the alliance, that is very clear. And I've seen the way, in concrete terms, those have developed in the last uh, just five months since the summit with the enhanced forward presence, by the way, uh, Canada playing a strong role working together with Latvia, but US, Germany, and, uh, and uh, the UK are also involved with the, the other Baltic states and, and Poland. So there are concrete and very uh, powerful steps afoot in terms of building up defense capacity and the ability to defend and deter uh, in Eastern and Central Europe. So that's the first thing. But also the other core, uh, core task coming out of Warsaw was projecting stability. And I saw that for myself uh, just uh, in, on my first trip a couple weeks ago. I went down to Montenegro and uh, had an opportunity to participate in the uh, exercise that was going on there on emergency response. People scratch their head and say, does NATO do emergency response? Well, yes, NATO had gathered together countries from across the Western Balkans. The Montenegrins were, were leading the effort and had helped to organize it. And it was proving that NATO could bring not only security to that part of the world, but also benefits for the countries who are often skeptical about NATO membership. In this case, they were spending a lot of time on that exercise, pulling people out of the water, exercising response to flooding, which had scourged the Western Balkans in recent years because of heavy rains. And so NATO is doing a lot in that kind of projecting of stability to also make the case for NATO as a strong alliance that serves security, but also helps those countries through bad uh, patches, through difficult times that they have to deal with, just in the, in the order of things. And oh, by the way, I thought it was fascinating that very week, looking at the Sputnik News film up here to begin with, that very week, you may recollect, that Russia and Serbia were exercising next door. And uh, there were a lot of Sputnik news stories about NATO's aggressive action in Montenegro and exercising with the Montenegrins and others. Well, the funniest thing about it, here we were, and we were able to send out a lot of pictures of these rescue operations and, and how well everybody was, was exercising together on emergency response. But the other thing we were able to do is welcome a Serbian team to Montenegro. So Serbia was uh, exactly doing the balancing act it has been doing to work with Russia at times, and also in this case simultaneously to work with the NATO alliance on emergency response. And that was an important message we haven't yet talked about today. We talked about the open door policy, but the other core principle for NATO is that countries have the right to choose their own security relationships, their own security partners. And if they choose to have two security partners at once, well, so be it. That's their necessity, their choice, perhaps some political drive <coughs> there. But I, I also wanted to get that out on the table, that that has to be one of the basic principles as we, as we move forward. Sure. But in present, you want to? Yes, I wanted to comment on, on that as well. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we've mentioned op the open door policy as well. Um, let us be realistic. Billions of dollars are not going to scare Russia. I think what is also very important here is our solidarity, our resolve, being quick and nimble and reacting to Russia's actions. I believe that the mistake that we made with the Crimea, with Ukraine, was being too slow in our response. 
being too divisive, being too hesitant, which by Russia was interpreted as weakness. And in truth, it was a weakness because we were not able to assess the situation quickly and see that Russia was testing how far they can go. Now, we're forgetting another area. When we talk about Russia's role, we concentrate on Ukraine and Eastern Europe. But what about the Southeast Europe, or what some people call it the Western Balkans? I don't like the term because it signifies ghettoization of a number of countries who, are, who for a number of years, um, have been trying to become uh, members of NATO, and we've found all sorts of reasons why they haven't so far. I think it's crucial to speed up the open door policy. Montenegro will be there um, in a few months. But what about Macedonia? You know, the quibble about the name, can that be more important than the security situation? I think that needs to be resolved through um, the good offices of all of us at NATO to get Macedonia <coughs> into NATO because we've seen Russia's influence in the region. You've mentioned uh, the exercises that were actually very close to the Croatian border. Russia, Belarusia, and Serbia. What message do we take out of that? Um, just um, two decades ago, there was a war between the then, then Serbia, Serbian regime, and Croatia. Do we think that a war cannot break out again in that neighborhood? Unfortunately, it can. Uh, please do not take me as somebody who's predicting a doomsday over there, but there have been so many problems from Russia's influence, uh, political, uh, security, uh, economic intelligence and through political forces, through some political parties and individuals in Belgrade and Serbia, and I'd be very cautious about that balancing role. It's um, easy for some of the politicians to say that they're trying to balance both sides, but we also need to be realistic at looking at Serbia wants to go. And I'll be the first person <coughs> to welcome Serbia into NATO, as a matter of fact, uh, when they decide to do so, and I believe that they will in the future. Uh, but look at Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republika Srpska, more or less an open influence from Russia uh, with the recent referendum, um, what we fear is the country breaking apart. Uh, from Croatia's point of view, we strongly support territorial integrity and sovereignty and political emancipation of that country. I don't think there is enough focus by the international community, by the European Union, by NATO on Bosnia and Herzegovina and the potential centrifugal forces that could break the country apart. I speak very openly of what needs to be done and sometimes, I've, unfortunately, the West looks at me with some sort of um, hesitance or, or even a suspicion that I want a third entity for Croats, etc. No. We want a stable Bosnia and Herzegovina with whom we share a very long border, and we want finally for Bosnia and Herzegovina to be able to decide on their own future and to shape the political processes in their own country. What about Kosovo? Um, Albania is a member of NATO, but not of the European Union. So Russia is working more or less openly to delay these processes and to take these countries away, claiming the Slavic Brotherhood the connections that actually never existed before, and looking at a renewed, self-determined spheres of influence concept where their projection of stability is not a series of democratic countries, but a series of countries that can be controlled and manipulated from within. And this is what we have to fight. Um, at the same time, we cannot look at Russia as an enemy in NATO is not an enemy or, or an adversary. And NATO enlargement is not aimed against Russia. But there is the clash of the mindsets that I explained in terms of perceiving security. So we need to continue working with Russia, engaging with Russia, because we, if we do treat them like an adversary, they will soon become one. And it's a very uh, fragile balancing act, but it can be done. A different balancing act. A different balancing act. We need to stand firmly. There is no compromise about uh, the postulates of international law, state sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence, and the political, the right of every country to decide on their political future, including, including Ukraine, Georgia, and the countries in our neighborhood. But we also need to work with them in creating um, at least a, an atmosphere of cooperation in combating threats that we will be facing together from international terrorism, ISIL, to migration waves and many others.
Both of you can come in. Yes, please. <laughs> We've been balancing for quite a while. We've been uh, seen and we've been presented and are still presented in Russia as uh, uh, part of one nation, basically, Russia and Ukraine. We are not. But at, and this did not preclude Russia to come in and the, to come in to Ukraine without any invitation at the point when we were at our weakest, weakest point of our statehood because when the president uh, um, Yanukovych has fled the country after Euromaidan. There was no understanding of the chain of command. And that's exactly when we had to welcome this little green, polite or impolite people to our territory. And then all of our partners said, please don't shoot. Please don't shoot back. Don't protect yourselves. Don't even try to protect yourselves. And we listened. Because we probably were hoping that, well, we'll get it fixed. And you're, thank you very much for, for actually admitting that Initially, the reaction um, took longer time than it should have been and was not as robust as, as we in the um, 21st century would expect it to be to an act of illegal annexation of one country um, against another country in the, in the middle of Europe. So um, this balancing is also pretty tricky stuff. And it does not uh, mean that, uh, uh, that uh, if you are balancing that you would not invite Russia to come and to, uh, to take your territory or to, uh, to come and bring tanks and multi, uh, multiple rocket launchers uh, to your territory and artillery systems and, and regular army uh, to your world. Um, I also wanted to say that um, I think that, that deterrence and defense um, that you Rose, were uh, referring to, I think that's a very good foundation for the future dialogue. So I think that's exactly what Russia understands. When you, do, when you are capable of protecting yourselves, and that's what Ukrainians are doing right now. We are building our armed forces. We, and, and that is not in order to, to become a more militarized nation, but to actually seek a political and diplomatic solution to the uh, aggression that we are finding ourselves under, we need to also be very capable in terms of our army and be capable of protecting ourselves. And, uh, and we, by the way, with regard to spending, we are spending 5% of our GDP right now for security and defense. It's not that something that we would like to do in such numbers and, and such scale, but that also has to be understood that the country in such a dire situation economically is also paying a huge price for, for trying to become a more efficient in protecting, uh, protecting itself. So, um, you know, back in, in, 90, uh, in early 90s, in early 2000s, all the nations that have been aspiring to become NATO members, uh, they wanted that membership because they, they didn't, didn't want to, to be an easy target anymore. They wanted to be protected by some, some sort of collective security. So I think it's just natural that, um, that they are taking this further to those nations that are in the neighborhood uh, in the southeast of, of Europe and uh, to those nations that are aspiring that in the east of Europe as well. Um, well, I wanted to agree on the fact that there are I think areas that we can cooperate with Russia on, but I think we need to be clear that when Russia acts aggressively, as it did in Ukraine, um, as we saw the interference to try and prevent uh, an agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, um, when they engage in elections, as they just did in the United States, um, trying to create confusion about our elections, then we need to respond accordingly. And so I think, I think we really need to be clear about that. And as we talk about an open door policy for NATO, I think it's in our interest, it's in the NATO country's interest to look at how we can encourage Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, Macedonia, other countries who are interested in looking to the West and looking at NATO and being part of um, that organization and our um, Western block and adopting these values, democratic values, to do everything we can to encourage them and help them um, do the reforms that they need to in order to be full participants. Senator Shaheen, just before I, I um, bring the, uh, the audience in for, for, for questions, uh, uh, 
Referring to the election campaign, uh, it, it seems pretty clear that Russia did try to influence the, the campaign. Senator uh, McCain said uh, in, in the previous session, and we were able to hear it, that he didn't think it actually made a difference. The fact is they tried. Uh, there are some people who would say that's an act of war, or at least an act of very serious aggression. Do you not believe the United States should respond with some kind of sanctions against Russia for that, if it can be proved? Um, I'm hopeful that we are going to see some hearings in Congress to take a look at exactly what role Russia played in our elections. Um, what we've heard to date from officials within Homeland Security and our intelligence community is that um, Russia's effort was to create confusion about the election, and certainly I think it helped to do that. Um, but I do think we need to look, we need to have a full examination of what took place, how it happened, and then come up with how we should respond. Because, yes, I think it, it was an act of aggression. And just as going into Ukraine was a different kind of aggression, um, we put in place economic sanctions, which I hope we are going to roll over again and make sure that they continue until Russia behaves differently. Um, I think we ought to look at um, what we might do in response to their action in the United States elections. So, I mean, uh, as with anything else, one doesn't just jump into, into a response, but we, if it, once it's, the process right. has gone through, if Russia is found guilty of doing this, there are going to be, in your opinion, there should be very serious repercussions for this. <laughs> I believe we should take a look at what happened and come up with a range of potential responses to address it. But no response is not an option. Again, I think we need to, to have a full-blown hearings. I think we need to look at what happened. And I think we need to make, um, come up with a range of responses so we can make it clear that that kind of behavior is not acceptable. Right. OK, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, this is the first person I saw literally was right there, a gentleman from Georgia. And then over here, um, Andrei Sanikov from uh, Belarus. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, and uh, thank you for an uh, excellent panel. My question is, uh, and uh, comment together, is uh, not more about the responses to Russian actions, but more about the proactive strategy, which is uh, much more important. Uh, Russia, by its actions, uh, is uh, not only uh, trying, also trying to distract uh, Euro-Atlantic community from having proactive Euro-Atlantic agenda. So one of main points uh, is to build Europe whole, free, and at peace. And the NATO is essential component for it. It's a foundation for it. So um, for the last few years, we saw this, uh, well, uh, if, if, if this agenda was not put aside, but at least I uh, was really slowed down uh, on, on, on uh, implementation of this agenda, especially, I mean, the NATO is toward expansion. So how do you see, uh, uh, well, uh, new momentum toward uh, with the new, ad new US administration? Is it possible to us to expect new momentum toward Europe whole, free, and at peace? or? Uh, it's just uh, going to be management of uh, uh, responses to the Russian actions in the future. And over here with um, Andrew Sanikov. <coughs> Thank you. Andrew Sanikov, European Belarus Foundation. I would like to uh, raise the issue that was already addressed here, starting from David Kramer. Um, about the possibility of a deal of the new U.S. administration with, with Russia. Um, I think it it's, uh, causes a lot of fear, a lot of concern. Because, um, you know, what I, I don't understand. The Baltic states are reassured because they're in NATO. What about those who are outside NATO? Uh, Ukraine is also a different case. What about Belarus? We are not in NATO way, we, we, we are living under dictatorship. We don't have any wish to continue to live under dictatorship. We don't have any wish to live under Kremlin domination. How we 
can be protected because, you know, uh, Budapest Memorandum was mentioned several times here. I was negotiating Budapest Memorandum from Belarusian side. It was not easy. I would say it was very difficult to get it signed. Now it's gone. And it's ruined not because Russia attacked Ukraine. It's ruined because the West didn't react to it. Because the West didn't take the steps that were stipulated in the Budapest Memorandum. What if Belarus occupied? And there are options for Russia, a lot, lot of options. Crimean scenario, Donbass scenario. We don't hear any mention of uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia uh, these days. So it's like a like basket case already. Nobody, everybody is af afraid to touch these issues. What, what can we expect? We need reassurances because uh, like we are not different from Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians, Poles. We will not live under dictatorship. We will fight for our freedom. But we need reassurances in instead of Budapest Memorandum. Not only uh, statements, but legislative, maybe executive reassurances. Because our independence is not independence of fake independence of a dictator. So that, that's the issue. But, and I would like to ask you, do you share our concerns and what could be done to prevent this turn of events? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take uh, one more over here, and then we'll take one more here, and then we'll come back uh, to the panel. Rafael Rohuzinski, SACDEV Group Canada and IISS UK. So I'm going to ask maybe a bit of a contrarian question. Um, given the video that we saw and the general sort of timbre of this conversation, it's clear that NATO's resolve has really come around deterring Russian aggression. But does NATO really exist only to deter Russian aggression? Is there a more collective security agenda at play? And I ask that partially because in the last session we discussed Syria, which sits adjacent to Europe and which probably represents a much more existential uh, threat to Europe through migration and instability of a large region than does currently uh, Ukraine. We also have previous NATO commitments in a country called Afghanistan, which seems to be generally absent from this security forum. So if NATO actually has a mission other than deterring Russian aggression, what is it? And is it as unifying? Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, Shlomo right here. Thank you. Uh, Shlomo Vineri, Israel. Uh, there seems to be a sort of a consensus here, especially European and Central Eastern European consensus. But I wonder, because there are other voices within NATO today, especially in Central Eastern Europe. You have uh, skepticism coming from the Prime Minister Orban of Hungary. You've got some sort of skepticism in Slovakia. You've got President uh, Zeman in the Czech Republic. So how are you going to address those issues if it comes to a necessity to have not only a united policy vis-a-vis -vis together with the United States, but also with some of the members of NATO in Central Eastern Europe? Thank you very much. So I'll just very quickly run through. There were four questions, one from, uh, from George about having a, uh, a proactive strategy that Russia aims to subvert a proactive strategy. Is it possible for new momentum to be built, or, or, or is that, is that uh, dissipated now? Uh, Andrei Sanikov from Belarus uh, raised this question um, again, which shows just why, how many people are nervous about this, the possibility of a deal with Russia in which people, uh, the people of Belarus, for example, who've been fighting for freedom, and some may know that Andre um, fought the presidential elections, and if they'd be actually been fair and freely counted, would now be the president of a free Belarus. Instead, he was sent to a KGB prison. Um, he knows what he's talking about. Um, number three was, does NATO exist only to deal um, with Russian aggression? I mean, Syria is surely far more important an issue in terms of our direct security, uh, Afghanistan also. Um, is that something that, that, that we, we need to consider? Is that a false dichotomy? Can we do both of those things at once? And finally, Shlomo Avineri from Israel um, suggested the problem is also in Europe. There is skepticism about NATO in Europe. We're all big about Donald Trump and, uh, and commitment to NATO uh, and, and our commitment to, to deterring Russian aggression. But there are a number of countries in Europe itself um, that, that seem to be, to use a Margaret Thatcher phrase, going wobbly about, uh, about NATO and its commitment uh, uh, to defending itself. 
So Maybe I'll start. Shall I start? Yes, please. There's a lot of uh, very um, meaty skepticism uh, here in all these questions, but I'd like to make a, a few comments just to begin. First of all, uh, I want to actually start with Shlomo's question about uh, Central Europe. Because, as I mentioned yesterday to this audience, I'm, I'm uh, the newbie. I just uh, started this job a, a month and a week ago. But I will say one of my first trips was to Bucharest, where I took part in the meeting of the B9, so-called Bucharest 9, which are the ministers, in this case it was a ministerial level meeting, of those countries across Central and Eastern Europe. And I was disposed to be concerned because of obviously a lot of ups and downs in the political environments in those countries. But what impressed me about this meeting, and don't take my word for it, there was actually a very good statement that came out of that meeting a week ago of strong commitment to, uh, to defense and deterrence and cooperation inside the NATO alliance. And so I do think that there are certain uh, political, uh, polit political factors afoot nowadays. I uh, referred to it earlier. There's no question about it. There are stresses and strains that flow from a number of different directions, some of which have to do uh, with uh, you know, some of the same forces that are at work in the United States at this moment and that we saw in our last uh, election, nationalism, populism, and, and so forth. However, I have been impressed, as I've begun this job, the degree to which countries gather around the current goals and priorities of the NATO alliance, despite the fact that they do have political differences going on in capitals. So I wanted to underscore that this is my early impression. We'll see, Shlomo, if over time my view changes on this. But I certainly was impressed by the B9 meeting in Bucharest uh, 10 days ago. Uh, taking on, uh, I'd, I'd like to group the, the questions from Georgia and, and uh, Belarus together because I wanted to talk about my sense again coming in of the new attention to the power of partnerships inside NATO and juxtapose this clearly against what we were talking about earlier, the reality of the open door policy. The door is open, countries should have the opportunity to choose their own security relationships, those two core principles that we've been talking about all this afternoon. But what I've also seen is a new interest in strengthened and enhanced partnerships, joint training, joint work. In fact, we just uh, finished an interesting series of, uh, of exercises in Georgia. And uh, the NAC, uh, the North Atlantic uh, Commission, was in uh, Georgia just last month uh, in, as a group. So, this is a good sign, I think, of the way that NATO is thinking about increasingly sophisticated and developed partnerships. And I think we have to, I'm, I'm a pragmatist in many ways, I'd, I'd like to put our emphasis where we can really make some, some near-term progress. And this is where, where I see it on enhancing the partnership relationships. And finally, on the question about is NATO all about deterrence and defense of Russia, I mentioned there are two main strands of activity coming out of, uh, of uh, Warsaw. One is deterrence and defense, but the other is uh, projecting stability. And here is that notion of NATO as a 360 security organization. It addresses challenges in, uh, in different parts of the world, and uh, Afghanistan has long been a uh, coherent uh, NATO mission. So now the challenges come in dealing with uh, the situation in uh, the Middle East. One of the most, I think, important decisions that came out of the recent defense ministerial was to expand NATO's uh, cooperation in training for Iraq, not only training in Jordan for Iraq, but taking NATO trainers into Iraq. That may seem like a small step at first, but it is actually, I think, a powerful symbol of the way that NATO is addressing uh, its um, priorities, not only to deterrence and defense, defense in Eastern and Central Europe, but also the requirements of security to our South. Would anyone else like to comment on the... Uh... Well, yes, certainly. I mean, reducing uh, NATO's mission as uh, being just deterrence against Russia would be contrary to the concept of NATO the fact that NATO is not in any way aimed against Russia. NATO is so much more um, about security, 
um, about defense, but also about values. It's not just a security, a defense alliance, it's also a political alliance. And sometimes we do not put enough emphasis on the values of solidarity and all the other values that we want to protect in the alliance. Uh, so it would be wrong to re reduce it to our relationship with Russia, and I think that the challenges will be appearing all around the NATO space that will require, as I said, a certain degree of cooperation with Russia as well in order to be able to deal with them. And, you know, please don't take me wrong, but um, as I said, protecting the principles of international law not compromising about them in any way, being very firm in our messages, in our, in our action, but also being very realistic about the security environment. Uh, so we need to avoid divisions in Europe, and NATO was precisely the integration process that erased the divisions between the right and the wrong side of the Iron Curtain that we had in the Cold War, and embracing the countries who wanted to beat democracies and part of um, ultimately set the Western world uh, in nourishing the same principles of democracy and uh, the, the protection of our countries. Um, so in um, looking at how this, some of the Central European countries that you've mentioned, basically the V4 countries, the Visegrad Four, um, th their position is not against NATO in any way, at least I have not noted in my personal contacts with the presidents or the prime ministers of Hungary, Slovakia, Slovakia or the Czech Republic, um, any desire to get away from NATO, on the contrary, to work together with NATO. Um, there may be nuances in terms of uh, cooperation with Russia, but certainly I believe that all the V4 countries will stand together in solidarity with NATO uh, in our defense and deterrence posture, especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, with Belarus, uh, um, Belarus, it's difficult to um, send reassurances from NATO when Belarus is not one of the aspiring countries to become members of NATO. So NATO obviously cannot be a, po a world policeman. There are other institutions and organizations from the OSC to the United Nations to the European Union, ultimately, who should be protecting um, the right of uh, the people in the country in order to uh, choose their future, their political future, in line with the Helsinki Final Act and in line with the other principles and postures of the organizations and the alliances that I have mentioned. Now, with Afghanistan and Syria, we are there in Afghanistan we are, I believe, doing um, very good work. It's a, it's a difficult situation, and I think that we need to pursue, we need to carry on, we need to stay in Afghanistan, because if we leave prematurely, we'll then have another threat of not just international terrorism, but we'll have a threat of migrations of millions of people going towards the European Union and putting pressure where uh, certain areas of Europe will be destabilized by huge numbers of refugees and migrants. Syria is a different issue. We do not have agreement within the UN Security Council that would produce a resolution or some kind of international legal basis for NATO to be able to act. But certainly we individually as NATO member countries need to do a lot more in order to stop the war there. There has been too much bloodshed and we need to start solving uh, all of these issues from migrations to terrorism, uh, to Syria, ISIL, and others at their roots where they um, become issues that can certainly and will certainly reflect back upon our own security. Did either of you want to add to that? Um, what any of the points? This has there? sort of been covered, but just in terms of is NATO just there to address Russia? We've seen the new mission in the Aegean to help address the migrant crisis mm -hmm. in Europe, something that is very critical. I think the, the whole new intelligence effort at NATO to look at how we address terrorist activities. I mean, one of the best ways for us to address terror, potential terrorist threats is through intelligence sharing. Um, the exercise that Rose talked about earlier in Montenegro, where 
countries were getting together to do emergency exercises to see how to respond to emergencies. I mean, all of those are great examples of what NATO is doing now, um, the development of a policy around cyber threats to address the whole gamut of threats that we face um, in the world. And so I think to assume that NATO is just there to respond to Russian aggression, which I think is very important, but that's certainly not the only mission. And in fact, um, as we look at other potential threats, they're maybe even broader at this point. Can I, can I add in a, in a question? Because I mean, uh, I remember when I was, I was at a conference invited by, kindly by the McCain Institute um, in Georgia early in the year, and it was about NATO, and the Secretary General was there. And, and I had a look before my panel at the communique from the Warsaw Summit. Mm -hmm. And as I remember, NATO, uh, Russia, was mentioned 57 times in that communique, uh, emphasizing that clearly Russia is on everybody's mind. I mean, there's no question about it. We, we, it would be simply pointless to deny it. How one handles it is another matter. In the interim period, bringing it back to what has just happened in the United States with the, with the election uh, of, uh, of Donald Trump, in the interim period between now and, I believe, January the 20th, when President, well, when Donald Trump becomes the President of the United States, do you foresee any dangers where there's a vacuum here that might be filled? And, and may I put it first of all to Deputy Secretary General, is NATO on a sort of amber alert, not literally, but a sort of mental amber alert, that this is a potentially dangerous time when there's a vacuum going on? Well, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, the Warsaw Summit, uh, I think, um, really uh, brought into sharp focus the challenges uh, and, and brought into sharp focus also NATO's resolve to deal with the challenges emanating from uh, the uh, aggressive Russia we're seeing today. So that is a reality of our day-to-day -day existence now. That said, my sense is at NATO at the moment, um, and watching, I'm still in my old uh, Sovietological hat, you know, reading the Russian press quite closely and so forth. I do think at the moment there's a bit of a wait and see in the Kremlin. and. I, for one, have trouble seeing uh, with the notion out there that perhaps there'll be a, uh, a new uh, relationship with the White House between the Kremlin and the White House, uh, why, uh, what the rationale would be for the Russians to, uh, to push a new crisis at this point. That said, it is always good to be cautious because if we've learned anything, in the, last, uh, in the last year since the 2014 incursion into Ukraine, and even before that, of course, 2008, and what happened with, uh, with Georgia, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia, I think it's absolutely important to uh, stay on your guard. Right, and, and, and Madam Deputy uh, Prime Minister, in Ukraine, again, in this interim period, and feel free to expand on to other, other aspects of this, in this interim period, is there a heightened sense of danger that Putin might try something? We are on alert anyhow. So we have to be on alert. Uh, we understand that you know we, we are dealing with um, creativity of that country every single day on our territory, both um, militarily and also with different like, subversive activities with um, also help for quite a few of the populists in our country and I, I'm sure you also see the same happening with the support of Russian Federation of different right and left, um, far right and far left political parties in different um, um, countries of the uh, of the European Union. And, and um, so therefore, I do not think that our alert could be higher, okay? It's, uh, what is it, red? I think red is about as high as you can get. There we are, and unfortunately, we cannot relax. Right. Um, so, but I, I wanted to resonate a bit with um, uh, the comment of a uh, gentleman from Georgia. Um, my feeling during um, initial stages after invasion of uh, Russia, um, Russian invasion to Ukraine, uh, 
with regard to different institutions, including NATO, was that it's all the time about reaction in in UN, in the EU, reaction to what Russia is doing. And I think the Warsaw Summit, um, Warsaw NATO Summit, has actually provided already a little bit of this proactiveness right now. And this is something that I, I see that NATO has kind of got its script together and uh, got, got its act together and can um, and is seeing already the, you know, the cold um, um, horizon of all the threats and challenges that, uh, that are coming from different parts of, of the world and, and not necessarily, or different uh, uh, types of threats and is already ready to suggest something proactive and that's, um, but it took some time and that's time, I think that that what uh, created additional um, anxiety in our part of the world as such. Right. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, Sorry, can I, can I just yes, add yes. about the vacuum of the transition? Let's not, let's not think about it just in terms of uh, Russia's influence, but other forces using the vacuum, such as the religious extremists, especially the Salafist movement, that we feel in Southeast Europe has started to <coughs> stir commotion in some of our neighboring countries. That's very interesting. So we, in other words, we clarity quick clarity is very important from your point of view for those reasons. Exactly, exactly. We need to be very firm on that. Um, you know, two months is a very long period of time for us. It's um, not just the returning fighters from ISIL, and now there are estimates that there are thousands of fighters coming back to our neighboring countries. It's the, the influence, the interference that we see with the political processes and with everyday life in changing the face of Islam, for instance, in our neighborhood, then compounded with the migration threat of what Turkey will do. There is a lot of, um, I won't say fear, but uncomfortable feelings of what will the transition period mean for our region uh, of Europe and of the world before the new administration comes in. Um, what about MH17 in Russia? Does anybody Well, have? it's the same thing. Russia is denying, you know, you tell that there is all the evidence that Russian regular troops are on the territory of Donbass. And Russia says, no, there is none. You know, back in early 2014, um, President Putin has actually said uh, there are, we have no um, at, uh, attachment to this little green man that were there in Crimea. A year later, he publicly stated, proudly stated, that it's exactly the uh, Russian special forces that have been guaranteeing the um, quote and unquote uh, a peaceful referendum in Crimea uh, to join Russia. Um, and I hope that everybody understands that I'm saying it ironically. Uh, so. And the same thing with MH17, and we see the actions that Russia is right now pulling out from uh, the um, ICC. So we we that they do not want to see um, any international uh, criminal court ruling um, being applied towards uh, Russian Federation. And I think that that that's all part of. Uh, these are all parts of the same chain, so to say, how they are trying to twist the reality and uh, not accept the, the results of the GIT, uh, the, the joint uh, international team, that the investigative team that is working on MH17. And I think uh, already the evidence that has been presented, everybody is trying to shy off from that evidence somehow, again, um, because it has been presented to that, uh, that book came from the territory of Russian Federation and then left to the territory of the Russian Federation. So I am assuming that th those were not, um, I don't know, um, Latvians or Estonians who came from Russian Federation, mm -hmm. right, with that book, and obviously not Ukrainians. So, and I think this is, uh, but Russia will deny it till the, uh, I think even till the very fact when the, all the last names of 100 people that are on the list, um, um, that, that might be connected to that, which is not yet proved with specific, uh, specific uh, particular people, they will be denying it when it will be printed uh, um, and, and uh, uh, black and white stated that it has happened so, 
or we will still see some uh, variation of what has happened mm. in, in Russian uh, interpretation of it. Um, we have to finish exactly on time on this occasion because Deputy Secretary General has to get a, a flight. We have four minutes left and therefore I wanted to give each of the panelists one minute um, to either answer my question or make any comment they like in one minute. And I wanted to start, uh, to, to end where we started, but with a more optimistic, potentially optimistic slant to the question. In six months' time, when the dust has settled, that's optimistic in itself. That's but when optimistic. The, I, said, <laughs> I meant when the dust, dust has settled in the United States of America, and you probably meant the same. Um, when the dust has settled after the American election and the United States president has taken office, do you believe, all of you, that NATO uh, will be in good shape, uh, that some of the rhetoric that we heard in the campaign will have been long forgotten, and that we can resume the business that was started in Cardiff at the Wales summit and push forward at the summits in Warsaw, and that NATO will continue to go from strength to strength. And perhaps if we start from Senator Shaheen and work back to uh, Deputy Secretary Shaheen. Um, well, I do believe that. I think um, we see every day with every um, meeting that happens the um, reinforcements as to the importance of NATO and why it needs to continue. But I wanted to make another point, because the discussion has been um, as we look at the United States sort of throwing up, you know, some people have suggested we should throw up our hands that um, we don't know what's going to happen in the interim and um, this new president is taking over. I, I would just point out that we have a president who's going to stay in office until January 20th. People are not walking off their jobs tomorrow. Um, you know, we're still going to have our mission to NATO that's going to continue. We're going to have our ambassador at the United Nations that's going to continue. And there will be an orderly transition of power on January 20th. And we may not like all of the, I may not like as a Democrat, all of the policies of the new administration. But I am committed, like the rest of my colleagues, to working with this new president, to healing divisions within the United States, and to continuing American engagement in the world. And I think you will find that that will be the case with the new administration. Thank you. I think we should expect your optimistic um, development of events, um, just making sure at the same time that during this period of six months or two months or next couple of months, whichever uh, time frame you want to, to put, we all are very much mobilized and actively engaged and actively working and making sure that the facts are laid very clearly, that the arguments are, are made absolutely um, again, mm, clearly and, and, uh, and in, in line with the rules, laws, values that we are all placing our countries upon, our fate of, uh, the fate of our countries upon. So if we are all engaged and if we are making sure that we are being heard, I think that then this optimistic scenario is, is right there to, to, to see. Thank you. Madam President. Yes, I do believe that in six months' time, NATO will be where it is today. I just would like for NATO to be more nimble and to continue to reform in terms of what I mentioned earlier, that we start looking out of the box of security that we've been in for decades, look at the new challenges and start responding them, to them by building new capabilities and by uh, looking at ways how we can continue to reform more quickly. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, you would all expect me to be optimistic, but I really do want to, uh, to uh, join the president in saying that it's going to be absolutely necessary for NATO to do some heavy lifting in coming months. The reform of command and control, for example, so we can be more nimble about how we handle command and control with all these new arrangements coming in to the alliance with EFP, with the, with the uh, High Readiness Task Force, with the follow-on forces. These are um, important and layered defenses that are going to require sophistication of command and control. So NATO has heavy lifting to do. There's no question about it. I am optimistic for the reasons I cited at the outset, but we cannot sit on our hands and just uh, accept that uh, we're doing great and that's all there is to it. There is a lot of hard work to do, and so we'll have to have, you know, join hands with many of those around this room in order to make it happen. 
Well, here. ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking uh, the participants for a fantastic panel. Okay. Well. Please join us for coffee and exhibits in the.